Yo, it's Dean here. Uh, I ain't cut my hair in four months, but what I have been doing is listening to Kevin Kelly talk about the future. Where is the world heading to in the next few decades? What is going to be the next big revolution after the internet? How are robots going to help us in the near future? What's more important out of flying cars or Twitter? These are all things that are discussed by Kevin Kelly, who's an editor at Wired. He's someone that's described as applying long-term thinking to the rapidly evolving field of technology. I first heard about him when he went viral for 68 bits of unsolicited advice, which were 68 pieces of life advice that he dropped on his 68th birthday. So I spent a lot of time listening to his talks in his YouTube channel and here are the most important bits that he mentions. So the first point he mentions is software will eat the world. What he means by that is software is dematerializing everything in the world. So physical objects are being turned into code. So he calls this becoming liquid because we're going from solid, tangible products to liquid, intangible services. So for example, information used to be our book, photographs used to be physically in our hand, money was physical cash, but now all of that has become digital. So we're moving from products, which are nouns, to services, which are verbs, from books to audible, from music to Spotify, from DVDs to Netflix. So these services are intangible. You can't feel them the same way you could feel a DVD, but they provide the same service. So that's a direction that we're going to keep moving into. Becoming liquid means we're moving from the world of material to ideas. So ideas are more important than atoms. What he means by that is, intangible things are more important than the tangible things. And more value is now being created in the world through intangible products. The value of a lot of things today is in the intellectual property, the IP. So that's the intelligence and the design skills that have gone into making it, rather than the cost of the materials needed to build it. So things like Spotflix, Spotflix, Spotify and Netflix, a lot of intelligence and design skills has gone into creating the service, but to build it, it's just lines of code rather than back in the day needing plastic and metal to make DVDs and CDs. But ideas are more important than atoms because ideas are more easily shared now and ideas have no value unless they're shared. So ideas that are shared become foundations for the next ideas. So the more ideas that are shared, the more value will be generated and the more civilization will progress. The way that we increase wealth in society isn't by keeping ideas, but by bringing them out into the public as quickly as possible. So this is different to sharing a physical item because only one person can use it at a time. You can't show it to everyone in the world. When you give it to someone, it means you don't have it. So ideas are way more important than atoms. He also discusses a quote from the billionaire investor, Peter Thiel, who said that we wanted flying cars, but instead we got Twitter with 140 characters. But what Kevin Kelly argues is that Twitter is actually better for the world than flying cars because a communication tool that can share ideas to billions of people across the world for free is more valuable to progress in civilization than a form of transport that can get us to A to B slightly quicker than what we already have. So it's made me realize that sharing ideas is more important than sharing anything else. That's why I've started the YouTube channel. That's why I've been way more active on social media than I used to be. So he builds on from that saying access is better than ownership. So there's a long-term trend to moving away from owning things. If we have access to things, it's almost as good as owning it because it will be immediately available. You don't need to put in the time and money for the upfront cost of creation. And you don't need to worry about the costs for storage, maintenance or upgrades. So for example, new companies today like Uber, they don't have any products, they don't own any cars, but instead they just provide the service. Because people would rather not own the car and just pay to access it when they need it, because then they don't have to pay to buy the car up front. They don't need to pay for insurance, for repairs, storage, upkeep, parking. So a lot of things in the world will follow this trend of becoming liquid, where we'll pay to access it rather than own it. The next big revolution to happen in the world is going to be with AI. So AI will become ubiquitous, it will be everywhere, and it will be available to buy just like we buy electricity today. We're entering the fourth industrial revolution. So we went from mechanical to electrical. Everything that used to be powered by humans or animals was given electricity to be able to power it artificially. So for example, a door knocker was turned into a doorbell and then we went from electricity to internet. So for example, the doorbell is now an internet doorbell where it has a webcam attached to the doorbell. Now we're moving from the world of internet to AI. So AI put into a doorbell will mean that it might be able to scan who's at your front door and tell you who it is. 
So the same way electricity provided power that amplified our muscles, AI will be able to amplify our minds. So we'll be able to add AI to things the same way we add electricity to things today. So before the equation used to be take X and add electricity to it. Then it was take X and add internet to it. Now it's going to be take X and add AI to it. So the vision is this is going to be everywhere in your house it's called the internet of things where everything in your house has AI in it. So for example, your oven, you'll put something in it and it will tell you what's in it and it will automatically set the cooking time and temperature. Your fridge, you keep a running inventory with expiry dates. So it will tell you when you need to buy some more of something. It may even combine a list of ingredients to suggest recipes to you. And even like your bed will be able to track your sleep and change its firmness and temperature to be able to give you a better sleep. So the reason why you don't think see these things right now is because it requires a web of things to happen like policy and regulation and also faster internet speeds through things like 5G. So the idea of putting AI into these things doesn't make sense right now because it's too expensive and it requires a lot of sensors. But as soon as AI becomes cheap and ubiquitous, it will be everywhere. So when thinking of AI as artificial intelligence, the way we think about intelligence is flawed. We often think of a gradually increasing scale like this, where AI is smarter than all humans and animals. But intelligence is much more like levels of different attributes and skills like this, where each line is a different type of intelligence. With these animal bars, this could be, for example, a squirrel, which has higher bars for spatial memory to remember where its nuts are and physical agility, or this animal could be a hawk where it has high intelligence and vision. So also you see like humans are generally good at multiple different things at the same time. The machines that we'll create will be smarter than humans, but only in specific dimensions, not overall. This is called artificial narrow intelligence, whereas AI being better than humans at everything is artificial general intelligence, which isn't anticipated to happen for a long way off. So in the near future, it's all about artificial narrow intelligence. So for example, there will be robots that can cook things, but they won't be able to play football. So there's no point making robots better than humans at everything because we can just make more humans. It's easy for us to be generally good at everything. What we struggle to do is become very good at very narrow fields of intelligence, which is why we make robots. Also, he talks about machines will not be made just to help us with work, but also for entertainment. So you've seen robots currently dancing in Boston Dynamics and used to see like robots fighting like in robot wars, but in the future, like at Transformers level scale. We'll design robots for very specific things, like you won't see Optimus Prime cleaning your kitchen and Boston Dynamics dancing robots won't be designed to help repair your fridge. So the blocker right now for walking, talking, intelligent robots isn't the intelligence, but it's the power. Our brains run on less energy than light bulbs and our bodies run on 0.25 horsepower compared to normal cars which run at 100 to 200 horsepower. So there's no machine in the world that uses energy as efficiently as us. They currently need large fuel cells or batteries in order to power them for a long time. That's why the next robots will be in cars because they're big enough to fit big batteries in. But in terms of time frames, it's difficult to say because whilst we can see this coming up next, we shouldn't confuse that with it coming soon. Thanks a lot for your attention. See you later.